get things started. Go ahead and share. All right. Hopefully that's working. Are you guys able to see my screen okay? It's coming. It's coming. Yep. Yes, yes, sir. There. There. Oh, let me get back here to the right slide here. All right. Is that coming through okay? Yes, yep, sir. Yes. All right. Terrific. Yes. So welcome, everyone, to the Boise ITSM Talks meeting for March 16th, 2021. I'm going to go real fast through my introduction slides here and then make sure we get a chance to work on having our panel start off. So first of all, thank you for taking the time out of your day to attend our March virtual meeting. I wanna have a special welcome to all of our first timers and especially those outside of the voice series. I was mentioning for some of the folks that joined early, we went to virtual meetings back last September and it's been great because we've been able to expand the audience and have some folks that uh, are outside of the area be able to attend. And of course, we'll introduce the panel here in just a minute and appreciate all of them taking time to be a part of this today as well. I'm not going to read through a lot of our vision and our why. It's pretty straightforward. We, our main goal with this meeting is just to try and help everyone become better leaders and to share information that they can take back into their organizations and to try and help fill some of the voids and some of the white space that's out there in our organizations. We have a fantastic panel today that is going to walk us through some slides and share some thoughts around this whole idea of coming in with ITIL4 and talking about this relatively new concept of a practice. In ITIL v3, we had 26 processes that were defined. They were somewhat aligned to different stages or phases of the service life cycle. And now we have ITIL 4, and we have a completely different framework and expanded this idea of process into this larger concept of practice. And we're going to have our panel, which is, consists of Donna Knapp, Judy Sanker, Keith Sutherland, Greg Sanker and Rianne Bruno talk to us about their thoughts and share some different ideas around this concept and why it happened and what does it mean in the real world. And it's gonna be fun to have some of that discussion and then we'll have some time at the end for some Q and A. All right, let me switch my slides over real quick and we'll get into the deck. Is that second slide deck making it over okay? Are you guys seeing that? Right now we're still seeing, I'm still seeing panel. Okay, let me hold, okay. I must not have shared, I gotta share it, both of them here real quick. So let me try and switch that over. Come on back to that one. Okay, so let's see if that works. How about now? There you go. There we go. Okay. There we go. That looks familiar. All right, so Donna, <laughs> that's right, and, and surprise, Donna's going to kick us off and walk us through some of the content around uh, why we have ITIL4 practices, so go ahead, please, Donna. Thank you. So this image shows the ITIL service value system, and there's plenty of great information out there about the service value system. I'm going to focus in on practices, and I want to start off by talking a little bit about the definition of what a practice is and why we evolved to this concept of practices. Historically in IDLE, we talked about, and you know, a little pop quiz for you in IDLE 3, we talked about the four Ps, right? People, processes, um, products, and partners. Um, and, but the reality is that we tended to focus on processes and processes the definition of process hasn't changed in idle 4 an integrated set, set of activities that takes inputs and produces outputs that are of value to the customer. Now, one of the things that's important to recognize is that this process centric approach that we had in idle 3 actually served us well. If you go back to earlier, even earlier versions of idle back when things were simpler, back when we maybe needed to get some control uh, over the chaos that was reigning in our organizations, a process-oriented approach served us well. But in the last 10, 15 years, processes have really started to get in our way for a few reasons. One, in those past 10, 15 years, we've seen Agile emerge, we've seen Lean emerge, we've seen DevOps emerge. We've seen, and, and, and here's where we can speak to uh, the four dimensions, we've seen the need 
to expand how we think about this concept of a practice. So while we used to talk about the four Ps, we now talk about the four dimensions and you see those on the screen. They include organizations and people. People was always there. So why is organization important? A lot of your organizations may be moving to product oriented teams, for example. You may be kind of de constructing your central IT department and starting to embed IT professionals into your lines of business. So organizations are changing their structure. And this could also include interacting with suppliers and partners, right? Crossing over multiple organizations. And we have to recognize the fact that there's no one way to interact within those different organizational structures. So whereas we used to think that you know, processes, we could define one way of doing things. And quite frankly, organizations were constantly looking for that prescriptive guidance in, in terms of how do I do, whether it was change enablement or incident management. The reality is there's not one way of doing things. We have to think about organizational structure. We have to think about the skills and capabilities of our people, information and technology partners and suppliers, and the other new addition to the four dimensions in idle four is this concept of value streams and processes. So I really wanna emphasize that processes aren't going away, they continue to be important, but what we have to make sure that we're doing is putting those processes into the context of their greater value stream. And value stream by definition is really just the steps that we use to create and deliver products and services. So we have to recognize that we've got to think at more of a macro level. There's a reason why DevOps has emerged and become you know, viewed as best practice within our organizations. We've got to break down those silos. We've got to learn to work together across value streams. And our processes are um, underpin those value streams. So a practice is really kind of that holistic view of the resources that we need in order to do work. And Jeff, if you wanna to go to the next screen, I wanna just very quickly speak to the fact that, and, and Jeff mentioned the service life cycle earlier. In Idle 4, <laughs> we do see a new structure for the publications. And the way the new structure works is that for every certification in the qualification scheme, there is a publication. So create, deliver support, drive stakeholder value, et cetera. Managing professional type courses are aimed at practitioners. Strategic leader is aimed at leaders and people who aspire to be leaders. What's different about these publications is that they don't include the details of the practice. It used to be that if you wanted to learn everything there was to know about incident management, you'd go to uh, the service operation publication and that's where you find it. Axelos has now kind of decoupled the practices from those core publications and we now have practice guides. And Jeff, if you wanna to go to the next slide, in each of these practice guides, you'll see a very consistent format and Greg's gonna actually talk coming up about what it was like to author one of these practice guides, but you'll see that the practice guides pr provide you general information, purpose, terms, and concepts. And, and think about why you adopt a framework. You adopt a framework to have that common vocabulary, to have that common view, that common understanding of what a given practice is. And then it provides guidance related to each of the four dimensions. So value streams and processes, organizations and people and so forth. And Jeff, if you wanna to go to the next slide. One of the things that's really important to understand is that part of the, the purpose of kind of pulling these practice guides out of the core guidance is so that they could evolve, so that we could do what, you know, we need to be doing this day and age, using more agile, iterative approaches. So that rather than the traditional kind of 10 years between publications, as new practices emerge, as um, new ways of working emerge, those practice guides can be really quickly updated and really be kept much more um, abreast with 
what's happening in our organizations today. So they are available online as a subscription service, which is referred to as My Idol. Attend any Idol class and you get a one year subscription to My Idol. An important idea is that what's in these practice guides represents suggestions. They represent things to think about. And what's cool about the practice guides is that very often they present alternative ways of doing things. Uh, Greg authored the, the, the change enablement practice. And so I, I think one of the most valuable things in that practice is a little table that exists that says, here's how you do change enablement in the traditional way with kind of manual controls. And how you, here's how you do it in an automated way where maybe you've got a DevOps continuous delivery pipeline in place, right? And recognizing the fact that, again, depending on your organization, depending on um, how your, the, the strategy that you're executing within that organization, how then you um, evolve and manage these practices is gonna be different, but you get those different insights. So as always, and if you wanna roll to the next slide, Jeff, what we want to be doing is adopting and adapting. Adopting a service management approach will always serve you well. Focusing on value, focusing on your customers, it will always serve you well in your organizations. That hasn't changed. ADAPT says understand your organization's circumstances and needs and goals. And one really effective way to do that is by applying the guiding principles. And if you haven't seen the IDLE guiding, guiding principles, I personally think it, it's one of the coolest aspects of IDLE 4 because it's in those guiding principles that you see where the influence of Agile and Lean and DevOps is coming into play. Lean, focus on value, very much that perspective. Start where you are, progress iteratively with feedback, right? Is very much an agile orientation. Mm -hmm. Collaborate and promote visibility is almost the definition of what DevOps is all about. So by understanding that these practices are not prescriptive guidance, and quite frankly, the processes in the previous versions of IDLE were never prescriptive guidance, um, but it's but it's extremely important to understand with IDLE 4 that this isn't prescriptive guidance. Rather, it provides you right, ideas and suggestions that you can use as a starting point for a conversation within your organization about, OK, how, given our circumstances, given our needs, given our organizational strategy, how then can we introduce and or um, evolve these practices within our organization. And I want to kind of say one last thing. For any of you that are like struggling a little bit with the just semantics of it, I get it. Very early in my career, I was given a very specific definition of the word practice. And I have carried that definition forward with me all my life. So I really had to, when I first was introduced to Idle 4, take a step back and realize that that definition and how idle views practices doesn't, doesn't meet, right? And I had to kind of abandon and move into the history books that previous definition of practice. So I get it, like if you're hanging on to a definition of that word practice, think about it as the way we work, right? And think about applying those four dimensions and those idle guiding principles to how we work. So Judy, what are your thoughts about this transition from practice to, uh, from, from process to practice and, and you know, share with us a little bit more about where where this conversation heads us. Okay. And, you know, as I first learned about value streams way back, probably with DevOps and Lean, I wondered at that point in time, several years ago, well, where does this fit with Idle? And so with Idle 4, we really can encompass all of these various frameworks and be able to understand how they fit together and how they feed off of each other. So when we talk about a value stream, remember value streams start with the customer, right? Always with that demand from the customer and always ends, 
right, with that value from the customer's perspective, being able to understand what's important to the customer. And as we think about the sequence of activities, right, what are those activities, whether they're direct value add or supporting or indirect or even non-value add? How do we distinguish? How do we identify those barriers to flow? How do we ensure that we have the right level of um, processes that are fitting within those activities Right. And so as as we think about, as Donna said, across the four dimensions, a value stream is that sequence of the activities that are related to design, producing right that product or that service and delivering that service. And remember that value streams are high level activities. Value streams also span multiple processes, functions, and organizations. So once we define who's our customer, right, and, and who's creating the demand for this value stream and delivering that value, we need to understand what are the, the components of those activities. And under those components, we will have multiple processes. So a value stream will span multiple processes. Processes. And in between those processes, we typically will have gaps. Those gaps could be wait time, which also in the lean world would be considered waste, right? Or maybe it's a constraint, something that is reducing the flow of that work, or maybe even identifying where we have rework. Right. So as we're looking at these processes, the processes are interrelated activities that transform the inputs into those outputs for a specific objective. And we sequence those activities together, understanding what are the activities and their dependencies. So value stream management and mapping will elevate those improvement efforts to that system level, having system or holistic thinking, right? When we go back to those guiding principles, yeah, let's think holistically. What is it we're trying to deliver? Not just our one little piece across the organization, those functions and the processes. So it provides a strategic direction and therefore governance as Greg will talk about a little bit later. The why and the where, helping us to define lead time and process time, right? So value streams are artificially linear and simplistic, but really the work is never that linear. So at a process level, we can show the decision points, we can show those loops or those iterations, especially with agile projects that we're delivering. And at the value stream level, we don't go to that level of detail, right? Remember, it's a high level. At the process map, then we can actually trace the sequence of those activities for a single process or at that micro level for tactical improvements, understanding who's involved in this process and how are, is this work coming together? Who's performing those actions, All right? So if we go on to the next slide, Yep, from value chain to work instructions, right? So from our perspective, this concept of the taxonomy is introduced in relation to the dimension four, value streams and processes. So if we're looking at the service value chain, right? And all of those activities at the upper level, we understand what activities are involved. Right, and as we go down this staircase, right, these cascading objectives and activities, we'll start then mapping out our value streams across the four dimensions, which include the processes, and finally then get to the procedures, step-by-step -step activities, and work instructions, very specific procedures that could be automated. Right, so we're relying on the practices to provide the resources for all of our, our uh, work across the value chain from value chain high level all the way down into work instructions. Right, so 
in terms of activities and how we're presenting this information to our customers. We rely on those resources provided by the practices and we need to understand how it works across the whole organization. So I think I'll turn it over to, to Keith. And Keith, I think you had some other words of wisdom here around this, uh, this cascading set of activities. Well, well, let's not get carried away on the words of wisdom. <laughs> but uh, to, to Judy's point, I do want to leverage this slide. But Jeff, I first want to go to the one uh, with Mr. Orzen and then come back to this one. Uh, so stealing shamelessly from Donna's material at the foundation level, I got to tell you, it, when I first saw this particular quote from Mike, and if those of you that don't know Mike, I met him through learning this concept of value stream mapping for facilitators. So whenever I showed this slide in a classroom, I say to the group, if this guy looks animated, let's be clear, he is very much animated and he's very effective in what he does. Now, the reason that I call attention to this, because there actually is a particular way that I explain, I actually ask my learners to, to look at this slide for about 15 seconds. And then I say, imagine a medical practice. Imagine a medical practice where I'm going in with flu symptoms and a toddler is going in with flu symptoms. We both have the flu, but I'm probably gonna get treated a little bit differently based on my medical history versus that toddler and how they're gonna be treated for the flu symptoms. And if I can kind of get people there, then there's no end to where we can take them. Because already by that point, they realize that from a practice perspective, you adjust on the fly, which is why I so much like Mike's paragraph, second paragraph here. But at the same time, he's not saying that we're not doing process work. So if I can, so, so, so if I can just take you back to a little bit of history, uh, you know, there's some, to, to what was said at the beginning of the session here, there are some old dogs in this session, <laughs> right? And, 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 and <laughs> I, my, my first purview into ITIL was 97, 98. Mm -hmm. And I met who became my business partner, uh, Butch Sheets, who's on the call today uh, in 99, 2000. Uh, as we were going through our B2 service manager stuff together, and I was meeting him for the first time. For those of you that remember, the word practice was something that may have been used prior to V4. Mm -hmm. But we used to talk in terms of a service management organization or office, a service management COE, or a service management practice with the concept being that that would be kind of the, think of the definition of service management, specialized organizational capability and capitalize on the word organizational, uh, a set of, a group of folks that we organize to be the internal consultancy for how we want to do the service management stuff at our company. So that's when I first saw the term practice. Now, now, Jeff, if we could go back to the other slide, I want to say a couple of things, largely leveraging a lot of what's been said already. So this concept of the value chain in idle four says that each one of those activities engages uh, in an internet interconnected set of practices, de de depending on what the activity is. And, and Donna and, and all the other folks that, that have been with me in a classroom, and, and I, Judy, I think you mentioned it, we talked about the value chain activities such as engage as a, as a macro level, right? Mm -hmm. Reaching out to internet interconnected practices like, like uh, let's say if it's engage, it could be relationship management, it could be service level management, right? Because uh, mm -hmm. many practices can be applied across many different uh, uh, value chain activities. So if I looked at if I looked at having a practice at a company, a center of excellence, and I said we've been here for this long with this practice, and I imagine Gray's going to get into a little bit of this. But here's where we want to take change now that we kind of look at it differently. And I will tell you, folks, that there is a big uplift in Idle Four from what we saw before, and I almost kind of feel sorry for the people that weren't with it and now starting 
now and got to learn about about lean and got to learn about ITIL and got to learn about site reliability engineering and got to learn because it's all connected. I mean, it, it really, really is. And so when, when I hear somebody like Donna or Judy or anybody say that the value chain activity is macro, but the practice is micro, I totally get that. But if you look at this, this cascaded step, you can say that you're going to, the practice could, you could be in a situation where the practice is macro and then the process stuff within that practice is micro. Mm -hmm. And if I say that the procedures are macro, I could actually also say that the work instructions are micro. <laughs> it was Butch that helped actually helped me understand that, uh, Greg's, again, Greg's going to talk about governance. It's so important. Everybody's, I think Greg will say, everybody's got to follow the procedures, but how they approach that procedure could be different, right? So for instance, if, the, if, your, if your service management practice at your company wants to be the, the be all to everybody that comes to it for their inter, internal consultancy skills, then that, that practice has to answer, how do we help the DevOps and Scrum people follow change? <laughs> right? How do we help the safe people follow change? And oh, by the way, SDLC and, 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 and uh, uh, whatever the other term is for SDLC, that's still living at places. I will never forget the ITSM for DevOps workshop that I ran at a really big company and having some really old staunch process people. And Keith, you don't understand, we haven't lost a payroll in 35 years and we are not going to go into this DevOps stuff now. But by the end of that two day workshop, they were like, damn, if I followed some of this DevOps stuff, it would make my life, my babysitting go away 50%. Mm -hmm. And then at the same time, the DevOps and Agile people were willing to follow the change stuff as long as we could simplify it in a way that it made sense for the way that they are trying to get done. And then you now enter these things called the DevOps tool chain where they got all these different deals. And if we want people to follow the procedure, we got to make it easy for them. And one example could be, how do we get more changes covered as standard for the DevOps community, mm -hmm. right? Just, just mm -hmm. one, one sample. So my biggest fear now, and I'm about to turn things over to Greg, I think, my biggest fear now is that Idle 4 has changed so much, and I think it had to, or it was going to die. But it has changed so much that I'm concerned about how we get people back. Because I think there's tremendous value. I think it's tracking ahead for a change of where most organizations, at least that I work with, are today. <laughs> Greg, you have the floor, sir. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Keith, that is something that we need to talk about for hours and hours and hours. And I Absolutely. It, Absolutely. It, it, the funny thing is we are in very strong agreement. So I'm going to divide this into two things. I do want to talk briefly about the process uh, of developing practices. So uh, I had the, the mixed fortune of being one of those selected by Axelos to uh, write one of the original, the, the, the first four um, practice guides when we were scratching our head going, what, what's in a practice guide, right? What altitude? Are we being prescriptive? Are we saying this is the way you do it? And these, these are challenging questions because, you know, for years and years and years, anybody that's been involved with service management generally or, or, or uh, uh, ITIL specifically, people come to class and they want to know, how do I do it? And I used to know the page that the process diagram for change management was in the service operations book because I would say, yeah, just turn to page 43 and there's the answer, right? And that's what people would take away. And so for years, almost a decade, I've been saying, it's not about process. It's about the capability to bring about the outcomes that you want. And so when Kaimar Karu, some of you know Kaimar back when mm -hmm. he was with Absolo, said, hey, I'm going to be in Seattle. I drove four hours to go sit with him in a restaurant and tell him everything that was wrong with ITEL 3. And in reward for that, he says, why don't you come help us? And, and, and so I, I was one of the original authors. And I say that with a, a tremendous sense of humility, because when you sit down and look at a blank screen and say, I have to write something that applies to a tremendous amount of diversity of organizations without being prescriptive, but also not being uh, you know, so open and, and free that it can't provide any guidance. It was overwhelming. And I will tell you, it was done in, a, in an agile or an iterative approach. 
So being the author of a practice guide is not like being the author of a book, you know, from days of old. It's not about me. It's about us and what we're going to do with it. So I, I really wanted to get that out there. Um, so capabilities became practices, and I'm perfectly okay with that because there's so much more than that, right? So this guitar back here on the background, like that could be thought of as a process, but my ability to be a professional musician is a capability, which is still severely lacking and, and, and underinvested in, right? So you, you think about that, that, that instrument doesn't do much sitting there. It has to have a cord connected to an amplifier, connected to a microphone, connected to all kinds of stuff. So the ability to create music is a capability. That guitar might be thought of as a, a, a process or whatnot. All right, so one of the reasons why I wanted to uh, help provide some context here is the shift from ITIL 3 and its focus, unfortunately, on practices to ITIL 4, which is more higher level, is I sat as a CIO for three going on four years, and my perspective on service management changed a great deal. So, Jeff, you're going to have to guess where the cues are. This thing is full of animation. So go ahead and just start and see if you can follow along with me. So there's this thing called governance. And it happens kind of up here in this space. And in and, and, and many organizations, that could be the board or it could be the senior executive, or in other cases, it could be, um, we generically call them governing bodies. And depending on the context, you have a governing body. But down below, hint, hint, oh, oh up here, we're responsible for the strategy, the vision, and the direction, which should probably be vision, strategy, and direction. But these are high-level things. These are organizational things. Why does this company exist? What is our vision? Where are we going? And you see it all throughout the ITO4 guidance. But those are governance. This is senior level stuff. Whereas down below, you have IT management or management generally over the function. And down here, we focus on things like the execution, the optimization, service delivery, all of those things that we know needs to be done. But if you notice, that's a hint, Jeff, to come down and look at the interaction between the two, this becomes very, very interesting because here at the intersection point, click, <laughs> we're looking at things associated with governance, which most of you know that governance is comprised, generally speaking, of three individual things, evaluate, direct, and monitor, maybe not in that order because it's not a linear, it's, it's an ongoing thing. But the role of governance isn't to manage and the role of management isn't to govern. They're two very distinct things. I actually run the last animation because that it lowers in this point of demarcation that is directly between management and governance. Here's why I think this is important because at the senior level, at the governance level, I can't sell I need to invest in my change management process. I need to make changes to my this or that process. It just doesn't sell because we're looking at outcomes. We're looking at a business objectives. And so the ability for ITIL4 to talk about what the practices are and how they support the business, now I can get their attention. Now I can get them very interested in why it is that we might need to make investments in practices or, or like I say, uh, capabilities, because then that starts making sense. One of the things that ITIL 3 or previous versions could be accused of is kind of focusing overly on the management of a function down below and not adequately addressing the governance or the tie to the governance. Some of you are really nodding your head. And th this became very, very clear to me as a 25 year service management veteran. When I sat at the executive table, I suddenly found myself ill-equipped to having those conversations. And I went to work on how do I cross that over? And I, and this is where we're doing that. Um, I think, I think I went really, really fast through that. I'm wondering though, Jeff, if we want to recover some of the time uh, to go in questions, I'm happy to answer any questions on this or practice guide authorship or, or any other relevant topics. Yeah, that sounds great. So are you just like putting me right out then, Greg? Oh, yeah. sorry. <laughs> oh, it's right here in my notes too. Rand. <laughs> Ray Ann is going to talk. You don't about. need to hear from Ray Ann, no. Yeah. So honestly, I'm going to make it really short too because I, I feel like there are probably some questions and I and I think it's it's very clear. So a couple of things I I pretty much thrown out what I was going to say because of my esteemed colleagues, they've hit on most of my key points. But what I love about Idle Four is it's really practical, and I think that's what you're hearing. And 
I remember, you know, when I'm teaching it or consulting with people, a lot of times they'd say, oh yeah, sure. We have ITIL until somebody escalates and the CIO says, forget those processes, just mm -hmm. help them. And <laughs> yeah. I think that really speaks to the challenges and the gaps that have existed for so long. And to Keith's question, I think the way we get people back is now it is connecting dots or it's, it's making it more clear that you're not going to come to a class and walk out with a recipe that you're going to follow and get all these results that we say you're going for. And I think one of the huge challenges is that we worked in very siloed ways. And it was pretty much like, guess what service desk, you own incident management. Hmm. And, and there's a process owner that owns this and it wasn't, it wasn't spanning, even though we said that processes spanned functions, it wasn't really happening, not from an ownership or mm -hmm. a practical perspective. And I think that if you step back and said, why weren't we more successful? Why didn't we accomplish more? Why did we only implement one process or whatever it was? It's because we were focusing on these very tactical parts of processes. And okay. I'm not saying everybody, but I, I feel like this really pulls it all together. And at a conference, when they were asking, hey, what do you wanna see in idle four? I asked them to get rid of my answer, my video, because I was a little bit embarrassed by it because I said, honestly, what I wanna see them talk about is organizational culture change because that's the real challenge. That's why people aren't successful. So when the four dimensions came out and there it is, I mean, I, I really think it is saying, it is to Greg's last point about capabilities. It is about pulling all this together, figuring out what our organization needs to do and what is that value we all need to deliver and recognizing that there's no just one owner and there's nobody excluded. If you're part of this experience, you've got responsibility and we need to clearly understand, collaborate, work together and not have all these competing priorities and, and really undo progress. So everything that was said kind of speaks to that. And that's my two cents. We can turn it over to questions. Yeah, and one question that I kind of wanted to answer for the group. So now we've kind of gone through, everybody's had a chance to speak and talking about defining what a practice is and why we are where we are today and what some of that means and some of the good sides as far as making that change. If I'm in the audience of this group or listening to the recording, and let's say I'm a process owner, or let's say I'm an organizational leader and I'm, I'm moving into ITIL 4, and I wanna think about what does this mean for me and what should I be doing differently? Or if I'm a process mm -hmm. owner, how should I be thinking about my role differently? I'll let Ray and you start and then anybody else that wants to chime in on that. What do you think about that? What should people well, do? I think the first one is not to just focus on my process, right? But focus on what it is we're really trying to do and, and where we're not able to do it and who needs to be involved. And it is about that culture. It's about the relationships and trusting each other and. And, and ultimately it goes to experience, right? How do we make a better experience overall, whether it be for employees or our company's external customers? And we all know that, you know, it's not about the transactions. It's not about these individual activities that we carry out. It's about collectively how we're impacting whatever those results are that we want. So I, I feel like it's asking more questions, uh, collaborating more, understanding, just all the cogs in the wheel, right? So if you go back to the analogy of the guitar, you know, do we have all of those pieces plugged in? Do we understand how they all work? Do we know how to grow the capabilities? So I think that would be the first step. Don't just, don't just focus on the process and be threatened by what do I do now that I don't own it, but feel like how can I be, make a difference in making this bigger, getting it to that place of all these pieces that we talked about. Yeah, I like that a lot. That's a great point. Greg, I know you wanted to add on to that. Yeah, well, I, it, it, sorry, Rayanne, for not uh, queuing you up. <laughs> okay. First of all, <laughs> second of all, um, I, I would say get up out of your desk and go. Go where other people are. Yeah. Go where the business is. Go where other people who are engaged in this. If you're sitting at your desk, have your coffee at somebody else's desk. Have your coffee at the coffee shop and bring somebody that you don't know with you. You've got to be working across the organization. You cannot be effective in your silo or in your specific corner of the organization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, if I can can jump on to really both, both Ray Ann um, <clears throat> and Greg, and I was thinking about, I actually had it wrote down, uh, actually when Donna was talking, um, when she brought up the, the four dimensions specifically, 
I mean, the value is not just for our consumer groups. The value is for each other as well. The value between the database team and the, and the application team or, or the cloud teams and the internal teams, whatever the case may be. Uh, I think we missed that. And I like when it kind of talks about, and I think Donna alluded to this, I think it was on the slide where she showed the seven, the, you know, all the principles. If you always keep those in the back of your mind, you're likely not to fail. Because when do we find out typically that the practice has too much rigor or it applies to this group or not to that group? It's because we, we find out too late and a sign of that is we didn't, we end up finding out that we didn't have the right stakeholders in the beginning, in the first place. And I love what Greg said, and I'll bring, I don't know if you actually used the word, humility. We got to stop thinking that our stuff can't be better. And we got to stop thinking that it has to be perfect. As long as it's even a little bit better than yesterday, it's still better. Yep. Mm -hmm. And if I could add one little thing to that, also don't measure success in a silo, you know, just, yeah. you know, the yeah. infrastructure is looking at reliability, the service desk is looking at service level compliance, that uh, you can have all of that, you know, the whole watermelon metric piece, right? I mean, that doesn't mean we're successful. And, and it doesn't, like you said, the perfection thing, I love the guiding principles, I think I use them every day of my life. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely. Yep. yep. Good. Anyone else on the panel want to add to that? I, I'd like to add a couple of things. So if, if I were to talk to a process owner today, I would say, first of all, you have to understand Agile, you have to understand Lean, you have to understand DevOps, you have to understand Sage. <laughs> you have to understand what they, how they have changed our world yeah. and how they can help you, right? If you mm -hmm. embrace Agile principles, it will help you eliminate this, it has to be perfect perspective, right? Because mm -hmm. we're going to progress iteratively with feedback. Right, And there is no such thing as perfect and there is no such thing as done. And we have to understand those things. Lean will help you understand stuff like waste. Mm -hmm. DevOps will help you understand the influence of automation. Mm -hmm. um, so first of all, you have to understand that. Second of all, you have to really embrace the idea of the four dimensions. And I'm gonna, mm -hmm. just cause y'all know me and know <laughs> I'm known to do this. I'm gonna crack the book. If you look up in idle three, the definition of process, structured set of activities, blah, blah. It may include any of the roles, responsibilities, tools, and management controls required to reliably deliver the outputs. So the four dimensions have always been there, right? Mm -hmm. In the definition of process, the four dimensions were there. But I suggest a lot of process owners did as Ray and kind of said, they focused on the workflow right? And they didn't necessarily extend that to the roles and responsibilities and making sure people have the skills that they need. Something Keith and I spent a couple of hours talking about yesterday. Um, making sure that you let technology inform how you design your processes, not tell you how to design your processes, but inform how you design your processes. Because the amount of automation that you have available to you should very much in, be influencing, right? How you lay out your processes um, and how you think about governance and how you think about control. Um, we really have proven concepts like policy as code and being able to have automated controls. So understand, right? Um, the four dimensions and, and kind of embrace that guiding principle of optimize and automate. And the last thing I would say is know that there is never ever a one size fits all view of things. And it's probably one of the disservices we did in idle three is that we kind of preach that there should be one instant management process and one <laughs> change management process. And really that's not reality. We learn in digital and IT strategy about things like dual operating models, right? So that's you right. may have parts of your organization that are full on digital, full on DevOps, and you may have parts of your organization that are full on traditional, full on waterfall. You have to treat those differently and you have to allow your practices in all of their glory, right? In, in all of the four dimensions, um, behave differently in those types of situations. So one size never fits all. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I add something to that real quick? Go for it. Uh, so many of you know that, that, that I talk about change management a lot. You might or might not be surprised how often I run into people who equate change management 
as an organizational capability yeah. and cab as a oh. specific prescribed technique. And when you come to, I think these are all safe faces here. When you come face to face with agile DevOps, mm -hmm. they, they get your cab out of here. And yeah. I, yeah. We don't need no stinking process, right, Donna? Yeah. Yeah. I'm, not, I'm not talking about cab. I'm talking about enabling change and the change outcomes yeah. that your organization needs mm -hmm. to be realized in the pipelines. That's what I'm talking mm -hmm. about. So yeah. that, that's a really and, good example, Donna. And I think yeah. also understanding what kind of work is going on in these other silos within our organization. If we have a DevOps team, what work is going on in that uh, automated pipeline? Are they doing adequate testing so that we as an operations team don't come back and say, oh, I need, I have this checklist. I need everything crossed off and, and checked off. Well, that's probably already been done. So let's educate folks to understand what can we eliminate and simplify in the operations world by utilizing what's already been done from a dev or an oper or DevOps team or agile team and always think about continual improvement, right? As Deming says, right? Oh we need goodness. to focus on it. continual she improvement. Did I did it. Yep. Yeah. Take a drink. Oh. <laughs> I know. You, you, exactly. Kudos to you. Um, and recognizing that it's probably be, being done better, even than you <laughs> yeah. have done it had we yeah. had a manual human being control mechanism. Mm. Yep. Probably being done better and more thoroughly. Mm. Hey Jeff, I've got something I want to add, but there's some phenomenal questions yeah, coming I was just in on say the that. chat. So I think we should tackle Trevor's. Yeah, so <laughs> Trevor's question here, and then I want to do some quick announcements, and then make sure we have some time for some additional. Yeah. So go so for it. Brian, you want May to I? just have a Trevor's question here. Go ahead. Yes, please. Uh, so I'm going to try to make this really fast. When I came to Siemens Energy and Automation in 1997, the reason IT was being restructured is because the CEO of the company said it doesn't work. <laughs> you know, that, that this is it. Blow it up. Start over. And there wasn't a lot of structure. Should have been the easiest job in my life because I was tasked as a director to do everything I had done in previous management positions was the absolute hardest job of my life, um, primarily because of culture change. But a couple of things. First, that CEO didn't believe in a mission. He believed in guiding principles. And his guiding principle was make Siemens easier to do business with. And his point was that IT is not doing that. So as we started to get structure, as we started to make progress, the CIO was actually in the business planning meeting where they built the strategic blueprint and it identified everything the business was trying to do in the next, next fiscal year, manufacturing, sales, everything, and how they wanted to make IT easier to do business with. So Trevor, that point, that level of transparency some of that, obviously it came from pain in that situation, but there's got to be that, it's got to come from the leadership. And this is that whole organizational culture change. And we do all have to understand why we're in business. We're not a business to be in IT, right? And we don't want to just be viewed as supporting the business. We want to be viewed as a vital part of that business. Mm -hmm. So as far as, I mean, for us, he got fed up and he asked for it, but I would love to hear from other people. How do you start that conversation? I, I think you have to start showing all the pieces put together and start showing what we're learning about the business uh, what we're understanding, how we're helping the business to do what it's in business to do, ask different questions, don't measure from a technical solution perspective, mm -hmm. start really measuring from a business perspective. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, so like kind of that Outside, whole yeah. coffee, go talk to them and, and change the questions and change the conversation. Mm -hmm. I'm sure we have some better answers from some of my colleagues here. I don't know, that's pretty good. <laughs> yeah, I don't know that I got anything better. I got some things to compliment. Uh, somebody mentioned product-oriented teams um, earlier, and you know the, the the implication is is this this team is working on X, this team is working on Y, this team is working on Z. I love that Trevor put this in the context of value streams because mm -hmm. the concept of value stream mapping is number one, it's supposed to really be strategic in nature. Mm -hmm. Number two, it does involve multiple stakeholder areas. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, typically, right? And so, and number three, it should be it should be sponsored from a senior leadership, you know, with it being strategic in nature, sponsored from a senior leadership uh, perspective. 
Now that means that we're serious about it because we've got a sponsor. They know that the focus is on the outcome. And it's amazing just what you can learn, just what you can learn by just establishing what the current state looks like, right? And we've got one organization that we work with that actually even invites their partners to those events because oftentimes their partners, their strategic partners, I didn't say supplier, I said partner, right? Mm -hmm. Has a vested interest in their success, but also brings an objective view, mm -hmm. right? And so I love, I mean, Butch always kind of said to me and he's on here and he's getting some love. He always said, there's nothing wrong with these I mean, I think IT people have to stop being nervous about what's going on in business areas. We need to partner with them more because that's a lot of the root of what Trevor is asking about. And one of the things that Butch said was, there's nothing wrong with having silos as long as we have integration across. Right. Right. So I think it just kind of complements or adds to, Rayanne, what you offered up. And on, and as I'm listening here as a facilitator, what brings this home to me too is we always used to talk about, even in the process side before we even really talked about practices, how if you're doing a good job as a process owner, your process objectives need to be aligned to strategic objectives of the organization. Yes. Mm -hmm. You yes. have that elevator pitch, right, to be able to say, well, why do I have this process? What's the value in it? Why are we investing or taking the time to make this improved? If right. you open the door to practice, I think that expands that definition even more because now we are talking about organizations and people and even the cultural aspects that we've been talking about and where not just does this process help us execute outputs better and maybe we can tie that some, to some business objectives or some business metrics, but IT can play an even bigger leadership role in shaping the overall direction of the organization and that's where things like digital and IT strategy and some of our other guidance can really come into place from that perspective too. You, you guys yes, all know he just went down the OKR arena. You do know that he did <laughs> that, right? And, and, and you know, what I would say is that measurement practice, I think it's so cool when they talk about the three things that you better keep in the back of your mind. What's our business strategy? Measuring achievements against those. Are we still trapping the relevant things that we need to be looking at? Mm -hmm. And well, I just think it's phenomenal. You know, I I think it's worth pointing out too that there's been an ongoing discussion about IT as strictly a service provider behind an SLA and IT as a business capability delivering on business yes. objectives. Mm -hmm. Yes. And one of the things, and I, I know I interrupted you, Don, and I'm going to yield in a minute, uh, is that ITIL4 demands that we elevate. You can't mm -hmm. effectively follow the guidance without being part of the business. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, digital and IT strategy, I always tell people that publication really does not talk about IT as a function. No, sure it doesn't. <laughs> it really just doesn't talk about IT at all, period. Mm -hmm. um, it's talking about the business. Um, but actually, uh, Greg, I was going to comment on your comment that this is why governance is so important. And I was getting in a little bit of trouble when I say this, but I'm among friends here, so I'm going to say it anyway. <laughs> Any initiative is going to succeed or fail based on the actions of middle management. Can I? Can we kind of yep. agree on Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Yeah. Right? Absolutely. So um, I think governance is really important. Back to Trevor's question about like that transparency. Well, where where is that strategy being set? And Greg kind of commented on this: the vision, the direction. That's being set at that governance level, right? That, that's being set at that kind of steering committee level. So if, if you're looking for transparency in terms of what your organizational goals are, tap into that, right? What are the decisions that are being made at that level? And maybe accept the fact that middle managers with all due respect, don't really always understand what those goals are or don't wanna hear about those goals right? Because they're being incented to maintain the status quo. So if, if there's a conflict within the organization between where we want to head and how we're incenting managers to behave and how we're uh, allowing them to succeed, right? You've got a problem, right? Because if they're being incented to maintain the status quo and maintain those traditional measures that you've been capturing, those IT-centric measures that you've been capturing for years and years and years, you're, you're kind of stuck. 
until you as a practitioner or as a process owner can really start tapping into those strategic goals and talking that language, right? Mm -hmm. Talking about what the business outcomes are and how what you're doing can change. Uh, yep. I think that's great advice for everybody yeah. here to, to take back and think about in terms of where they fit into their organizations. We're down mm -hmm. to our last five minutes. So real quick, I do want to share some announcements and talk about our next meeting and some of the other things that are going on real quick. So I'm just going to share my screen real quick, go back to my first presentation, and just do some quick announcements. So first of all, I always like to talk about some of the upcoming opportunities for people to continue to learn more and do some training. One of the things that I'm really excited about is we've got a strategic leader training package put together mm -hmm. that I'm working on with ITSM Academy with Donna and the team. So we've got foundation class coming up in April, the direct plan and improve class in May, and then the digital and IT strategy class in June. Mm -hmm. And taking all of those three classes as a package gets you to the designation of strategic leader in ITIL. And there's some strategic leaders on this call and that training is super valuable. I've also got some of the other ITSM Academy public training opportunities listed here. So take a look at those and definitely go out to ITSM Academy if you're interested in any of the other things that are coming with Essence of Experience that was mentioned. And then of course, one of my absolute favorite all-time classes I took back several years ago and wanna come back to, which is Certified Process Design Engineer. So mm -hmm. take a look at those. Some other announcements that are here. We've got our next meeting, which is going to be next Tuesday, April 20th. And Brian Jennings, who is someone that is yeah. on the call here, is going to be talking about how to make the most out of your software vendor relationship. So I'm very excited <laughs> to have Brian come in and share Sorry. his thoughts around some practices and some good stories around how we can do a better job from that perspective. A couple of other quick things. I've got Again, the link here, and I'll have that also on my meetup and on the uh, LinkedIn group where we've got the YouTubes of this recording and all of our previous meetings since we went virtual. We've got the Treasure Valley Agile communities having a lean coffee this Friday at noon. If you're available and interested in kind of getting together with the Agile community, we've got that. Our Project Management Institute has a monthly meeting as well. Um, March 24th, that's going to be a networking event. And then for Greg Sanker, who again, appreciate Greg being here and sharing his wisdom. I wanna make sure everybody knows about the Keep the Learning On blog and YouTube mm -hmm. channel that's out there. And those happen every Friday at eight and definitely take advantage. I'm not able to attend a lot of those live because of my schedule, but I do listen to the recordings on YouTube for those as well. And uh, mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to check those out. And if you like this meeting, I'd like to continue to see the audience continue to grow and expand. Please share this meeting with your peers and your circles, and please join us on our meetup and our LinkedIn group. That's all I had for announcements. So I'm going to go ahead and bring us back and see if there's any other questions from anyone here in the audience that they'd like to have answered. I don't have a question, but Greg just talked about a shameless plug, and I wanted to accuse Jeff of being shameless for mentioning CPDE. <laughs> <laughs> yep. good, good to put in the ITSF, ITSF uh, conference that's coming up here this next week too. Absolutely. Yeah, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah. And actually this Thursday is Thursday the 18th. Yes. Um, yes. DevOps. DevOps Institute is having one of its skill up days on mm -hmm. Thursday and it's actually value stream management. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to try to quickly find a uh, link, link for that. And it's, you know, it's kind of free. And it's one of those things where sessions run all day long. They get recorded. Um, and so that's actually this Thursday. And I, I participated on a, I'm participating on a panel for that. So I'm excited about it. Yeah, thanks for mentioning that one too. Yeah, there's a lot going on here, kind of in a compressed time frame. So lots of opportunities for people to take advantage of. Right. Well, and I think the value of this, where we are right now, and I think we're all going to miss this, is that these things are being recorded and you can go back and watch them at a later kind of date and time. And um, as much as I'm looking forward to seeing everybody at like a real conference in the future, um, you know, we're all going to be saying like, is it being recorded? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, right. Yep, I agree. Outstanding. I can't believe you got this done in an hour. I was ye of little faith. All of my panels did a fantastic job <laughs> their clock and their timing. I don't think I, you guys handed off to each other, right? I didn't have to facilitate too much. So it was great. Appreciate it. 
All right, I see some folks are starting to jump off. I know we're at the top of the hour. I'm happy to stick around and see if there's any other questions, but if people have to run to their next meeting, we can definitely formally close and uh, just thank everyone for being here and look forward to seeing you again. Thank you again to my panelists for participating and contributing. You're all awesome and um, definitely uh, grateful to have the opportunity to work with all of you. Yeah. Thanks, Thanks for having you. us. Thanks for attending. Yeah. yeah. All right. Thank you. Good job, Thanks, Jeff. All right. All right. Good job, everybody. Thanks, everybody. I'm Thank gonna you. jump off. Yeah, All me right. too. Thank All righty. Bye bye. Bye. Bye bye. Jeff, is there snow out in uh, Boise? We had one big snowstorm a couple of weeks ago, but it's pretty well all melted and we've been going back up to being close to 60 degrees and spring break, like I said, is next week. So I'm ready to turn the page. I'm ready for moving into nicer weather. You know, I used to, uh, I lived in Boise for six years and at the end of Pond Street, which is probably gone by now. Okay. But, uh, out by the, uh, the National Guard. Ah, yep. Armory. Yeah. Bye, Donna. Thank Bye, you. Bye, Donna. Cheers. See you, Greg. Bye. Thank you very Bye. much. So Greg. I was trying to, because I know, uh, I know another Jeff Jensen, and so I was kind of curious. <laughs> gotcha. But uh, yeah, I uh, actually have people that still live in that area, so.